on causal, or we've done, was on causal associative learning. A lot of this was done with Phil Corlett, my former PhD student who's now in Yale. And we've done some simple associative learning across a series of tasks, and I'll just briefly give you an overview of, of those. So this started with some work we did showing that if you get people to play a simple game in the scanner, the idea, this is just healthy controls, no drug, nothing, and you simply ask them to pretend that they're a representative of a drug or a working for a drug company and you're testing a new drug and you have to predict whether a particular drug will actually cause a particular syndrome or not. And it's just done on a trial by trial basis. And the idea here is that we build up expectancies and then we violate them. So they begin by making a prediction uh, about whether this illness would occur. They then get feedback and they discover that it didn't. And this would occur over a series of trials until eventually they'd learnt pretty well that this particular drug didn't cause the syndrome. At this point we could then violate it. And this, of course, brings us into the Rascal of Wagner model because we can plot on a trial-by-trial -trial basis what the change is here in this prediction error. And the simple idea is that in the early trials we should get a bigger response in prediction error dependent areas because there is no strong prediction and therefore anything is a surprise. But as we go from trial to trial, that activation should plummet until we re-evoke it through violation of expectations. So just simply looking for areas that do this and then this. We weren't ent entirely happy with that particular paradigm, so we devised another one. The problem with this one is that this particular trial um, is structurally very different to the, to the predictive trials. So we wanted to find a way of actually balancing that and really honing down our model of prediction error. And Phil Corlett came up with a very good idea of using something called retrospective revaluation. And the idea here was that we simply uh, asked people, again, they were to pretend that they were medical, but here they were looking at somebody who had allergies to particular types of food. And so they'd have either combinations of these foods or single foods, and they would be asked on a trial-by-trial -trial basis to look at the foods and then make a prediction about whether the person had the allergy or not. They would then receive feedback, let's say they saw this, they'd receive feedback that the person had actually had the allergy. This occurred later, symbolically. And again, they would learn that a matched pair of foods also produced an allergy. Now then, they would be presented with one of those foods alone, in this case, just the pear or the chilies. And they would learn that if you had a pear on its own, that produced an allergy, but if you had chilies on their own, that didn't. Now this produces an interesting phenomenon. It leads to what's called retrospective revaluation of the absent food. So if you see that pear and mushrooms cause an allergy, and you then see that the pear alone causes an allergy, you have a tendency to down-regulate your belief that the mushrooms cause the allergy. It's not that logical, actually, but that's what happens. If, on the other hand, you, discover, you see that watermelon plus chilli causes an allergy, but chilies don't, then you upregulate your belief about the watermelon. It's a very simple manipulation, but what it gives us is two sets of food about which people have different prior expectations even though they've had the same number of presentations, the same associative history. So they've both been presented with a, in a pair in association with an allergy, but now we've changed their expectations and we can then fulfil or violate those. And what we've shown across a series of tasks is that right prefrontal regions, mainly dorsal, although they've certainly moved more ventrally with later studies as well, plus uh, ventral striatal regions, and sometimes I hesitate to say where this is in the midbrain, but we're confident it's somewhere in the midbrain. We'd like to think ventral tegmental area, but you'd pro probably be crucified for saying so. Um, we've identified this system essentially in healthy control. So the question is, what happens to that system in people with schizophrenia? This is people with an early psychosis. And what we find is that we reran the study in controls and we showed that in the ventral or in the midbrain regions and in the right frontal cortex, we got the expected over or greater activation to prediction error compared to uh, fulfilment of expectancies. And we saw that in the frontal cortex too. But in our patients, there's a, if you like, a fudging of that relationship, a, a blurring of that distinction. So they show just as much activation to something that should be fulfilment of their expectation as to something that should be a violation. And they showed it in both those regions. Subsequently, Graham Murray uh, ran uh, a, a reward learning study on the same group of patients and there we showed similar pattern in the midbrain and a whole series of regions including frontal cortex. In the control subjects the more salient, the more prediction error dependent trials showed greater activation compared to the more neutral ones and 
this was reversed in psychosis. So these are the Murray findings from the midbrain and striatum, and these are Phil Call. It's the same sort of pattern. The controls are showing this brain distinction, and the patients were failing to. Interestingly, Phil then took exactly the same task and gave it to people both on placebo and on ketamine. This was a crossover study. And he showed that on placebo, you show in the frontal cortex the predicted difference, but that's lost under ketamine. So ketamine, which we know produces um, a, a psychosis-like state, will also have the same effect on prediction error-dependent firing. Now, this was at a low dose where they didn't even experience much of a psychosis. Um, but I'll come to that in a second. Phil then went on, Phil Collett then went on to look at the patients again and to correlate the frontal activation to prediction error compared to its control with delusion-like thinking as measured by BPRS, which isn't a terrific scale, but he produced across this subgroup or this group of patients a fairly clear demarcation in that those who are more prone to delusion-like beliefs were the ones who showed the least ability to distinguish uh, in frontal cortex between what should be surprising and what shouldn't, suggesting that delusions do correlate with a blurred prediction error signal. Interestingly, he took the ketamine patients and upped the dose outside the scanner so that they did experience some psychotic phenomena. And he showed that this right frontal region actually was predictive of their dissociative experience and their ideas of reference when they were given the high dose of ketamine. Now, the interesting thing here is what he showed was that the more sensitive you are as a control subject to a prediction error signal in your frontal cortex, the more likely you are when you get ketamine to experience the rather unpleasant uh, changing ideas or delusional type ideas. So there's almost a, a frontal sensitivity, an overfrontal sensitivity here can lead to a change or a, a particular vulnerability when you're given a higher dose of ketamine. Now, that's not a perfect design by any means because actually this, this brain measurement was done under placebo, which is not really a baseline. So we've subsequently um, tested a whole new group of volunteers. And this time we simply did the brain imaging a month before they had the, the crossover ketamine study. So the idea here was we're trying to get true baseline brain measures in a blocking task. So 18 healthy controls, subsequent crossover double blind study, give them ketamine and see if the prediction error response when they have the um, fMRI in September predicts how they're going to respond to the ketamine in October. It wasn't just, you know, just a month apart. And so what was the prediction of the, sim whoops, sorry. What was the prediction of the symptoms? Well, interestingly, this is the BPRS under ketamine and this is the right frontal region that responded to prediction error. Now this isn't very convincing because a lot of people under the BPRS score at zero. I'm afraid uh, for some reason this has been mean corrected. It is actually a significant correlation, but I don't quite believe it. I'm going to show it to you in case you do. Um, the idea is that the people who had the greatest frontal response to prediction error showed the greatest tendency to unusual thought content on the BPRS. So in some ways it's a replication. I think if it was the first time we'd seen it, I wouldn't even show it, but because it's re replicating the previous study, I'm showing it. Moreover, the dissociative symptoms also correlated with frontal sensitivity. So we've shown, we've replicated this idea that your frontal sensitivity to prediction error tells you what it's going to be like when you have ketamine a month later. And that was the original data, just to show the, this um, similarity. Can this be predicted by background personality scores? Well, it seems to be the case that frontal cortex can't, but striatal responses actually are, to some extent, predicted on the right and the left by um, magical ideation scores on a schizotypy scale. This is hot off the press, so I, you know, I haven't had time to interpret it yet. But basically, the people who show less sensitivity in striatum seem to be the ones who sh show the greatest degree of schizotypy in their, their everyday life. What that means, I don't know. I'm just really flashing it up at you in a... Um uh, OK. So those who want to leave, I'm not looking. Now, you do realise that Stephen Larez is the other speaker, and he's, he's front page news in the UK. Are you sure you don't want to see him? Thank you very much. You've made an old man feel very happy. <laughs> so now moving on in, within the same context, um, there's something else that we've just really been doing. We've been getting